Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the premiere episode of a series that I've been dying to get to and I've been telling you guys all about for a long, long time, and that is our perfect movie series. Now you say, well, what's perfect? Well, there's a lot of definitions of perfect. And so whether it's in a top 10 list or your favorite movie or whatever else, but I have come up with a list of 10 movies that we're going to be doing over the course of this year that is, that is perfect, whether it's Skyfall, The Dark Knight, The Social Network. But the one I wanted to start with is one of the most important movies in cinematic history and is perfect for many reasons, and we'll get to it later. And so I have a very special guest that, you know, we're, he actually sat down and watched it. And he's going to tell him about all about himself. But I wanted to let everybody know that, you know, what we're going to do. I have the five points. I'm going to give you a little intro about the movie. And then we're going to go into each point in depth. So let's welcome our, our guest, Gabriel, to the show. How are we, Gabriel? Hello. I'm doing good. How about you? I'm, I'm, I'm super, super excited about this. This, oh, this, I this, know. Is, this is like one of my... Next to Rounders, which is a little film by Miramax starring Matt Damon and Edward Norton and a couple mm -hmm. other people and Training Day, this is my number two. I can basically oh. recite every line. I've seen it 40 or 50 times. I didn't even have to rewatch it. It was like <laughs> ingrained in my memory. So um, tell us a little bit about you. Where are you from? What do you do? All that good stuff. So uh, my name is Gabriel. Please call me Gabe. Um, that's how I'm Everybody knows me and my friends call me Gabe. Um, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I live in Phoenix, so I'm in the desert. Um, it's very hot. Um, I'm a professor at Arizona State University, um, but I'm a nerd at heart. Um, I teach film classes. I teach literature classes, pop culture classes. Um, I got into podcasting about a year, year and a half ago. Been doing it sporadically because adulting. Um, and now I'm trying to like pick it up, um, and just make it part of like my world. Um, and then we just connected on Twitter and I got the invite and I'm super honored to be here and talk about Southern Southern Lambs, which is one yeah. of my top 10 movies of all time. It's usually yeah. on my top 10 lists. Nice. Nice. And what, at the end of the show, you can let everybody know where you can find that podcast and yeah, go follow them. I'm, I, it's going to be fantastic content that you get from them. Okay, so guys, here's this is how this is going to work. As I said, I'm going to give you a brief introduction into the uh, the movie, and then we're going to go point by point by point by point, and we're going to talk about what we think and why it's a perfect movie. So as I've said countless times, we are doing Silence of the Lambs. Uh, this is, by the way, this isn't for the faint at heart either. This movie isn't for the faint at heart. It's rated R, so if you have young ones, probably not the best idea. Um, this is, like I said, this is one of my top 10 films. Usually, um, it's usually in, consistently in my top 10 list of all time. Um, I have no idea why I was watching this movie when I was a kid, but I was, <laughs> uh, my, my mom let me, um, I love it. I, I think this is an outstanding movie. I think it's a movie that, you know, I understand when people go back to it and revisit and, and, and critique a couple of elements of the film but i think and one of the things that i always say by what i live by is that movies are a product of their time um and i think you have to look at them through that lens this movie is outstanding like you said it's one of only three movies to win the big five of the oscars i'm a huge oscars and awards junkie so i i those stats for me are just crazy um it probably gave us, no, not probably, it gave us not only one of the best villains of all time who is consistently in number three, um, always battling, I think it's like Darth Vader, Norman Bates, and um, um, obviously yeah, Anthony Hopkins is Hannibal yeah. Lecter and Nurse right. Ratchet. Like those four are always battling, but it gave us one of the best villains of all time. And it gave us one of the best performances of all time in Anthony Hopkins. So I think this movie is just outstanding and it, it really holds up. I, I watched it twice in the last week because, um, you know, I have nothing to do. So why not put this movie again? Um, and I think it's just fantastic. It's, the writing and there are a lot of a beautiful shots in this movie as well. Jonathan oh, yeah. Demi directed the 
the hell out of this movie. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why it's consistently in a lot of people's either tops or always in those lists of 25, 50 movies that like you consistently see Silence of the Lambs as one of the best pictures ever made. And to its credit, I think it's deservedly so. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's jump into the first point. And you were just talking about it, the acting. The acting is some of the best acting you will ever see put on a big screen in your life. Jodie Foster, Anthony Hopkins are the two, you know, the two main people. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because Jodie Foster had just come off doing The Accused a couple of years earlier. Yep. And she won her first Oscar. And so the studio had wanted her to actually... Um, be in this one. I mean, Orion was basically saying, we want her. And they didn't have a, a lead, a male lead at that point for Lecter. And so in stepped Gene Hackman. And Gene Hackman said, you know what? I want to do this. So he actually, what ended up happening was he bought the rights for half a million dollars. And so he read the book. And that's fine. Then he read the screenplay and he says, I can't do this. It's too violent. Because he wanted to, to direct too. Mm -hmm. He gives it back to Orion. They're now lost because they don't have a lead character. So one of Jonathan Demme's friends says, you got to go check out this guy in Europe. His name's Anthony Hopkins. And so he's coming off. I mean, he's doing Shakespeare and, you know, everything else. He's just coming off Mutiny and the Bounty, which at that point wasn't that good of a hit for him. So he goes over, talks to Jonathan Demme. And as, as the story goes, that... Anthony Hopkins, when he saw the title, he thought it was a children's book. And so what ended up happening was he's like, eh, I think I'll pass. Thanks. And so subsequently, his agent is the one that said, hey, look, you should probably, you know, you're not doing so hot here right now. You should probably take this on. You can't get any worse, right? So then he goes and he has another meeting with Demi. He reads through the script. He basically tells him what it's about. He's like, okay. Now, at that point, he I mean, goes back to the studio and says, I have a guy to play Lecter. They said, who? Like this guy named Anthony Hopkins. He's like, all right, we'll make a deal. You can have Jodie Foster. I have Anthony Hopkins. They said, fine. So the very, now, mind you, he, they had never met. Um, they had, he doesn't really rehearse that much. Mm -hmm. So one of the very first scenes that you see is him in his cage, you know, and this is after the, and still in the first act when they find, and she finds Shane Gump, the head in the, in the storage closet. And so she's sitting down and she says, I want to have a view. I want to be far away from Dr. Chilton. And then he just turns around and that shot. I'll help you catch him, Clonies. You know who he is, Doctor, don't you? Who decapitated your patient? All good things to those who wait. How long can you and Jackie Boy wait? Our Billy must be looking for his next victim as we speak. And then it cuts to American Girl with Catherine mm -hmm. Martin. But that shot in the way it was said, the deliverance of the shot, and the deliverance of the line was bone chilling. Um, I, I, the acting cannot be overstated and how well, when was the, do you remember the very first time you saw this? Uh, I was, a, I must've been like 10, 12 years old. Okay. So, so you must've been really scared. Um, uh, I, so I wasn't super, super scared because I'm a freak and I like horror. Okay. <laughs> so I was thinking it was scary in horror movies since I was a kid because my mom was a freak and she let me watch horror movies because that's what you do to a five-year-old, you know, put horror movies and traumatize yeah, them for life. Yeah, right, right. Um, but I was, I was, I was scared of him. Like, I'm like, I don't want to encounter that guy, but I wasn't terrified as, um, as most people would think would react just because I'm a psycho and I yeah, love no, horror yeah. movies as well. It, it just, so it, it just, in looking back on it, it's just an amazing performance and how it was done. And so, you know, I mean, as you were talking about, and we'll get to it in a bit, Lecter is one of those villains that's just an icon all time. Yeah. Um, the second point that I think that why I think this is a perfect movie 
is a strong female lead. Now, up until that point, you really didn't have a lot of strong female leads to really, they, they weren't out there, right? And what Demi did with Clarice Starling was amazing. Um, and you basically see the progression of how Starling grew, not only as a person, but she grew stronger to match with, with Lecter. Um, even the first shot you see of her walking through the FBI um, training area with the guns and you see all these guys. And then the shot of her actually getting into the elevator and she's the way Demi did it is the way he framed it is she was this tiny little thing and all these big guys were around her. And then she's the one that comes out. And the only other example really prior to that was a couple of years earlier in Aliens, you know, with um, Sigourney Weaver, you know, and basically she took a motherly role with Newt, you know, get away from her, you bitch. That was, that was it. I mean, there really wasn't a strong female presence. So that, that was huge. And as the film progresses, you see her start to get more powerful. You yep. start to see more. You see her start to match wits with. I mean, all you got to do is look at the anagrams, right? I mean, the scene in the elevator, and that's in the near the third act, when she's going up to actually meet uh, Lecter in, in Memphis, and so she's on her notepad trying to figure out the anagram, and the the cop's standing there and he's befuddled. He's like, you know, do you do you know what this guy is? And she's like, yeah. there's no. So it's one of those things as it, you know, miss the rest of, you know, Miss Hester Moffat, miss the rest of me. You know, nobody would have figured that out. Lewis Friend, Iron Sulfide or Fourth Gold. So she starts to become more powerful and she starts to match wits with him. Uh, what did you think about that as a character, how, how he developed Starling? Oh, I think Starling, you know, the acting in this movie is outstanding. Um, quick note on, on, on Lecter, on Hopkins' performance, like you said, um, you know, it's an iconic performance. And I believe the infamous scene of the fava beans and his infamous um, shattering of the teeth and mouth that I'm not even going to attempt to try. Yeah. Um, you know you're working with two master actors when that scene was improvised. That was improvised. He did it just for the fun of it um, to try to like do something different and scare Jodie Foster. And that's the scene that ended up being in the movie. You know, that's how there are a few roles that I say that people were born to play. And I think Anthony Hopkins is one of the ones that was born to play this character. I really cannot see anybody else playing Dr. Lecter. When it comes to Clarice, I think Clarice is such an, such an interesting woman and such a strong presence in the film because obviously at, for, at level surface she just goes wits to wits with Lecter she, everybody's terrified and she is um, I think it's normal that everybody's going to be terrified from a person like this but what's interesting is that she takes her fear or potential fear of this character and turns it into a weird admiration because I do think that throughout the movie there is this weird admiration that she feels or has towards him um which allows her to get on his level and i think that's why Electra allows her to go into his world and play around with his mind because he sees a challenge something that lector just as an intellectual never has right and that's why he like gets bored and i think that's the magic of her character and also her character is just written with great growth um, and it's very easy to fall, especially in the nineties, it would have been very easy to fall into the pitfalls of this traumatic event when you're a child and, you know, she's a woman, but I think it's developed in such a way and written in such a way that makes it just really, really good. And then the direction of the movie frames her story in a very good manner. Well, not only that, he basically, I mean, it's the whole scene of. You know, you tell me things, I tell you things. Mm -hmm. Quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. I tell you things, you tell me things. Not about this case, though. About yourself. Quid pro quo. 
Yes. The last thing you want is Hannibal Lecter in your head. Yep. So the thing is that, you know, she faced her fears. She faced it because up until that point, and, and by the way, the flashback, it was beautifully placed in how, because we never really had a understanding of who Starling was. Mm-hmm. We knew she was an FBI trainee, but we didn't know where she came from. And as the movie progresses, we find out, okay, her father was a sheriff who was gunned down and so on and so forth. And she's able to not only conquer Lecter, but her fears. And she grows stronger and stronger and stronger until the end, you know, in which we see where, you know, the police think in Scott Glenn and Crawford think they have this guy nailed down. Yep. And really, it's startling. And so, I mean, and that's one of the greatest scenes in the film is the cross-cutting. In that third act, in that three-minute frame where the police are about to barge into the house and she's going to knock on the door. And, you know, as the doorbell's ringing, you hear the, the loud alarm and then, the you know, they're about ready to go in. And it's just unbelievable. But I really think that the character development is something that was immensely important here because, as you said, they could have just wrote her off as, oh, okay, you know. Yep. But you see her get stronger and you see her use her, her presence in her oh, mind. Yeah. And not her sexuality either. That's nope. key. That's key. It's up here. So yep. amazing about that. And she also goes, now that you mentioned sexuality, I think she also goes in t- against that stereotype that was very prevalent in the 80s and 90s of the hypersexualized woman. Yes. Uh, where she is presented, and this is not a knock, this is just an observation on the stereotype of women that was in movies and TV at that time. She goes against that type of the voluptuous, the sexy, the basic instinct, right? But this is around yes, the era of the perfect. basic instinct perfect. Um, era. And she goes against that Sharon Stone-esque presence of basic instinct. She's covered. She, you know, she, she wants to be an agent. She's using, like you said, her mind. Um, she is not sexualized. She's always, like I said, really covered and, and could see, can't, could be seen as, dowdy and not like sexy among yeah. all of these men especially in the fbi surrounded by men her issues with you know her boss who you can make the argument that is in love with her and, 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 and by speaking of that things. to your point gabriel to your point gabriel that's like that scene when they're talking and so Lecter says well do you think crawford you know fantasizes about you and he's like yeah well, he's you know my superior and he's like I'm sure that he, you know, imagines you in positions that fucking you and everything else. He's like, frankly, that's something that Mix would say. So you see, you know, how things are are done so well. And there's that point in counterpoint, and it's done Mm -hmm. so beautifully. The third point I thought I'd bring up, and this is interesting because it's even today, 30 years later. This was one of the first films that had profiling. So when we meet Sterling, for the very first time, she's going up in the office in this behavioral science unit. And it's just, you know, a couple of offices and everything else. But they had no idea what they were doing at the time. They knew they had a killer they had to go get, but they didn't have this. Now, I'm fascinated with the psychology of serial killers and everything else because it's up here that really makes you tick. Yep. And... One of the most, well, the godfather, if you will, of of profilers is John Douglas. And anybody who knows the name John Douglas knows who I'm talking about. Yep. It's the one who did Mindhunter. It's the one who's read best-selling books. He is, you know, he was actually a creative consultant on this film. And so what ended up happening was you got authenticity, okay? I mean, Douglas has sat down with some of the most vile, disgusting, insidious men in the world. I'm talking about Ed Dean. I'm talking about the Son of Sand. I'm talking about Charles Manson. I'm talking about Ted Bundy, who actually this was based off of, okay? This particular killer, he actually took some elements of Ted Bundy because that's what he did. He abducted college Mm -hmm. girls. And what he did is he used a van. And so when we see that Catherine is going to get abducted, how does it happen? The whole ruse there, 
And then he, you know, brings her into the van, knocks her out, brings her into the van. So you see there are elements about that. And that's something, and this is brand new at the time. This is 1991, 92. So there wasn't criminal minds. There wasn't mind nope. hunter. There wasn't, this is brand new that nobody's thinking of. SVU, have, Law and Order hadn't started. It's about exactly. to start, but it hasn't started. Yeah. <laughs> so at that point, nobody knows about this. Mm. Today, it's all, you can go to your local Barnes & Noble and pick up a whole, I mean, there's a whole row of serial killer books and psychology and everything else. But back then, there was nothing. So when you get the godfather of this doing it, you know you're going to get something good. Yeah. And it's just an amazing piece or another element about it that people don't really understand and how it's done. Um, yeah, and it's just, and to see the growth of it and to where it is today, I mean, now you can major in criminology if you want, and you can, yeah. you know, that's a whole course that he teach. Unfortunately, the, the Netflix series, Mindhunter, only, I mean, they have a tendency of doing that, but it was only two seasons. I love that show. That if is you, the best you, Netflix show, by the way. It, I will die on that hill. It is an unbelievable show. And it's interesting because the guy who plays, I forgot his name off the top of my head, the guy who plays Charles Manson in the show for that episode actually played in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So, yeah, it's just, it's a phenomenal show. But the, the way the profiling was done, it was so revolutionary back then that it looks mm. second nature today. Um what you were getting at. So I'm going to go to point number four here, which you were getting at the villain. Let's talk about Lecter. How devious, insidious, witty, incredibly vile is this guy? <laughs> um, what was your first impression when you, when you, uh, you know, after a few watches and you grew a little bit older and I, what did you think about Lecter? Um, I, he is insane. And he is brilliant, um, and above all, brilliant <laughs> and brilliant. Yeah. I'll keep saying that word. I I've always been I like you. I'm fascinated. Um, I'm one of those that when a um, serial killer documentary drops on Netflix, I watch it uh, because I you know there's nothing else to do. So I'm I'm obsessed, and I think it's very easy to forget be that um, serial killers or you know people like <laughs> this, they're so monstrous. But I always say it's very easy to forget how insanely brilliant they were or are in order to achieve what they achieved um and that's not obviously i don't con i condemn no, everything ted bundy, they've done, for, to your, but to these your point, people were all geniuses ted bundy was one of the sp the smartest men yeah ever you, you have to be you have to be some sort of genius to a to, to get away with what you're getting away with right and i think lector is that the the and even more so because i think lecter is shown as you know a high culture educated man he's a psychiatrist you know he knows people and and his my fascination with lecter and how how i think lovely this character is is that he doesn't go in for the quote unquote kill right away he plays with you he wants to get to know you he wants to understand you in order to break down walls in order to then go for the kill that, that's, so a a kill. that's a perfect segue that's a perfect segue because what you were fantastic. talking about you have the just juxtaposition of him basically wanting the meal prepared right and and, and whether it's in the insane asylum or in memphis and then what ends up happening is that they bring him in, okay? And then on the flip side of the coin, he wants to eat your face. So you have a beautiful disaster, if you will, mm -hmm. of the dichotomy. And it's just so well done. I mean, it, you know, you can even go so far as, I mean, Hannibal wasn't as good, but you could still see it. And, you know, it, it's just, I mean, he's teaching an art course in a well-known museum in, in Venice, but he can slice somebody's throat, right? Yep. I mean, it's one of those things where it's just the music, the please, not on the drawings, you know, and they have rolled the drawing up and then, you know, unbelievable, and you, to your point, he's either, I think you said he's the number one or two villain. It's just unbelievable. 
Yep. And I could, can you imagine, let me ask you this. Could you imagine Gene Hackman playing that role? No, I, I can't imagine him. And I love Gene Hackman. I love Gene Hackman. I know he's happy. He's retired. I love him. He gives actually one of my favorite 90s performances. He's a two-time in, Academy Award winner. He's a two-time Academy Award winner. He gives one of my favorite performances in The Birdcage. If, if people out there have not seen The Birdcage, please watch that movie. You will laugh from beginning to end. Um, but like I said, I, I don't see anybody playing this role because this is one of the few roles that for me – People were born to play, and I cannot fathom, I fathom the idea of Anthony Hopkins not playing this role. It yeah. just, it would, it would, it, 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 it would not work. It just, it yeah. would not work. Maybe in a yeah. multiverse. Maybe in another yeah. multiverse, yeah. this movie was made by somebody yeah. else, and it maybe it ended up winning all the Oscars again. I don't yeah. know. But in this multiverse, where we are in this planet, um, I just don't see it. I think Anthony Hopkins, oh. What a yeah. performance. What I a know. performance. Yeah. It just it's an amazing, amazing It's just one for the history books. He is for it me. It really is, is. When I mix all of the acting, because again, I love Oscars. When I mix all of the acting winners and, and I would say and somebody tells me you have to pick your top ten Oscar winning performances from all four categories, there is no way that Anthony Hopkins is not in my top five. Mm -hmm. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is, it's one performance. Yep. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, he's done, don't get me wrong, he's done everything, he's done on the films. He's done re The Remains of the Day, he's done Meet Joe Black, he's done, you know, he, he did a, a cop He won a second movie. Oscar two years ago for The Father. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's just unbelievable to see what you can do. And, and, and you know, but, sorry, sorry, you know what, what's magnificent about the performance as well is that when you actually sit down and watch the movie... The movie, I believe, is like two hours long. Mm -hmm. He is in the movie 24 minutes. That is all he's in the movie. Mm -hmm. And you feel that he's in the movie just as much as Clarice Starling. That's how big of an impression and how big of a character and a performance that is. When somebody wins or makes that, not wins, but makes that impression... And you feel like he's in the entire movie. And when you actually step back and think about it, he's in the movie a little over 20 minutes. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. That, is, that is crazy. That is crazy. And the last the last point I want to bring up, and we were talking about this earlier. So the Oscars have been around for a very, very, very long time. And there have been many Oscars, hundreds of Oscars given out over the years and everything else. And there are only three films ever to win the big five. Now, once again, as I said on the top, there are five categories. Best picture is the crown jewel. If you are a uh, filmmaker, you want to win best picture. I mean, we're talking spotlight. We're talking parasite. We're talking, okay, that's best picture. Best actor, best actress, best screenplay, and best director. Now, there have only been two other movies of the course going all the way back. Okay, almost 100 years. It happened once, one night in 1934. One flew over the cuckoo's nest in 1975. And then this, and it took 16 years. Now it's been 30 years since that. I'm ready. I don't think, at least in my lifetime, or your lifetime, or whatever. And it has to be a special, special movie. Mm -hmm. But I don't see anything winning the big five between now and another. I mean, it was so almost 20 or 30 years. I can't see it winning in another 30 years. It's hard. It's difficult. It's, it's difficult. so hard. It's very, it's very hard. It's very hard. Um, you have to, You have to hit... There's many, and this is where we get a little technical. You have to hit many elements to achieve the top five, right? You have to find the right environment that we're culturally like in the right headspace, that it's a movie that appeals to everybody. And then if we want to talk a little bit about the Oscars, they have a weird system to choose best picture and the other categories they have a ranking system for best picture and everything else is on a popular vote. I think it's more difficult to find consensus for a movie to win those five while having a rank choice for best picture and while having an expanded ballot of 10, I think that's very difficult, which that's, it, that's an entire podcast on its own, right? Talking no, about absolutely. The and by the, the way, you, 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 you say that, and that, that's a good point. So 
one of the films we're going to be doing in a few weeks or down the line is The Dark Knight, the Christopher yes. Nolan classic by, you know, and that is the reason, and, Christopher and, Nolan and The Dark Knight is the reason the you, Oscars much, expanded Dave. the ballot because, thank you very let's much. be honest, The Dark Knight should have been nominated and probably would have won. And um, would, but, and, you know, why and not? that's you just took the words. So because of that movie, they went from five to ten. Yes. I personally think it should be seven. Okay, because mm-hmm. you're going to have your two or three front runners. Okay, your two or three dark horses, and then a, a couple for Markin, and that's it. Okay, like a I'm black a, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a five guy. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I mean, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back to five kind of guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I'm a traditionalist too. Yeah. I mean, but the thing is that, like Black Panther, for example. Yeah, phenomenal film. Did it ever have a chance to win Best Picture? Not a snowball's chance. It no, no, absolutely. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely not. And so I, get you. I think that seven, I mean, and, and that's why they say up to 10. And I think that. Well, this, and now this, they will, now they change it again. And now it's not up to 10. Now they went to a hard 10 again. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, I didn't know that. It, yeah. So, from, so The Dark Knight didn't get nominated. It was a huge upheaval in Hollywood and they changed the rules. And then from 2000. Nine and ten, they did a hard ten, um, and that's when we got. Which you know, I I I I know there's value to the ten because you get pictures that would you get movies in there that wouldn't necessarily make it in that deserve like. Um, in those two years, you had movies like District Nine, which I think is a fantastic sci-fi movie. Um, Toy Story Three, Up. You know, no animated movies have gotten in since Beauty and the Beast. This same year, actually, the same year because Beauty and the Beast co- um, competed mm-hmm. against Silence of the Land. So I see value on the ten. And then after 2010, until last year, they went anywhere from five to ten. We never got a hard ten again because they have to meet a certain percentage. Um, and that's when we started seeing eight and nine. I think. I think we never got seven. I think we always got eight or nine. And then this year, they're like. Last year, when like um, in the last two years post COVID, there were no really big blockbuster movies in there, and one of the reasons that it was expanded to ten was to bring in more commercial films because Oscars are seen as being disconnected from the people. So then this year they said we're going back to a hard ten, um, which you look at it, and I think this yeah, year is super I mean, cool because I think you're gonna have movies like maybe Top Gun, Avatar. Um, you could have a Woman King. Um, you um, everything everywhere. These are movies that wouldn't necessarily get in that are big blockbuster movies. So you know, it's there's value to it. But yeah. going back to it, I don't. I'm with you. I don't know if in my lifetime I will see a movie win the top five again. I think it is very difficult to find a consensus um, because you choose the winners in different categories in different ways. Um, there have been close calls. There have been movies that have been nominated a lot for their top five. You know, you've had movies like Silver Linings Playbook, American Hustle. Um, uh, I'm, I'm American escaping Sniper. a few of them. Yeah, um, no, you know, I like, just... You know, it's... that have been consistently nominated, but I don't think... I, I, it's very difficult for it to happen. Very, very difficult. Yeah, so, I mean, it, that... It's that only happened shows. three times in 90-some yeah. years of the Oscars. Yeah. And, that, and, that just, and that just goes to show you the, the, the enormity, the gravitas that mm. it has when you do a, a feat like this that you know it's unbelievable well it also so, shows you how much how respected the movie is i think for you to win these kinds of awards and run the top five you don't only you have to be loved but you also have to be respected because i think it's an honor right for us quote-unquote common folks people don't care about the oscars no we absolutely. love we, we're film lovers we love the oscar right? i love i live for the oscars i host oscar parties every year i love them but it's a sign of respect from your peers, right? Like, this is what we think is the best movie. This is, look, here it is, right? This is, you're going to go down in history. Like, I've been to the mu- to, to the Academy Museum. I've been to the to the Kodak, to the theater. And, you know, watching all those, you only have 90-some movies engraved in the pillars of, by the way, the mall. Because if you didn't know, if nobody knows, if people don't know, the, the Oscars are, ho- are done in a mall of, of all places. But, you know, you're part of history, and I think you have to have some level of respect. And this shows that Silence of the Lambs, they said in 1992, were for a movie in 91, in 1992, when the ceremony was held, you're going to join the pantheon of only two movies. One yeah. that was in the 30s, and one that was in the 70s. Yeah. Here so, is your top five once again. It's just it's just an amazing, amazing feat. And this, and this movie is going to live on. I mean, it's going to live on. It's going to be shown in film classes across this country for years to come. And um, 
not because of the content, but because of how it was made. And when you know some of the backstories, like Gene Hackman and like, you know, how Anthony Hopkins got in and yeah. the role. Well, even Jodie Foster, was... she wasn't the first choice either. No. Yeah. I mean, no. no. And so, I mean, it's one of those things where you look back on this and it's like, who could have done this? You know, and what you were talking, there is nobody else. There is no actor out there that could have played Hannibal Lecter. There's just nobody. I don't care the best, but look, Daniel Day Lewis is a phenomenal actor. He's won three Oscars, best pick, best actor. Oscar. He couldn't have even done it. I mean, that just shows you that. And he, it, it's yes, yeah. So, yeah, this. No, is, I agree. Yeah, he was not. No, yeah, and I know this is a perfect example. He made us believe that Lincoln talked and I looked love, like he did. I, I love, love Lincoln. I love Lincoln. Love Lincoln. And I mean, long, and come on, but, there will be blood. Also, one of the best male performances out there. But yes, there so. are people that are born. It's the same with Lincoln. I don't think anybody would have could have played Lincoln the way yeah. Daniel Day Lewis played it. it actually, yeah. that's one of my examples as well. That goes with Hannibal Lecter. There are people that were born to play those roles. Nobody could play Hannibal yeah. Lecter. So. Nobody. Anyway, guys, that's it. So that that that's our first that's our first perfect movie episode. Um, so we've got a ton, as I said, more to come. We've got, you know, in the coming weeks, you're going to be getting The Social Network. You're going to be getting The Dark Knight. You're going to be getting Heat, which I love all day long, twice on Sunday. Uh, you're going to be getting Skyfall. These are perfect movies. And not just because they made billions and billions of dollars, but because of how they would... Roger Deakins is one of the greatest cinematographers of all, of all time. You know, and you have Christopher Nolan, who's the greatest, one of the greatest directors of all time, and everything else. So... We've got a ton of great movies coming up. Um, not only that, we've got the roundup coming up for you guys. That's going to be out on a weekly basis. Um, you know, stay tuned for that. We've just got Elisa back. So that's great. Um, and, you know, we're going to be starting to, to mix in some interviews. I've got a couple up my sleeve that I'm trying to get. So, and, um, yeah, no, th this is going to be... This is going to be a huge, huge 2023. Um, Gabe, tell everybody where they can find you on Twitter. Um, you can find me at Gabucho Graham. It's in, it's here. Uh, my name is G A B U C H O G R A M. Um, I also have two podcasts, um, Split Real Podcast that I started with one of my best friends just for fun. We're um, just check it out. And then I have another one in Spanish. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. Um, and we do the same thing. Talk about pop culture, movies, TV, and that's Cultura Sequencial. Um, so check them out. Fantastic. And I can be found on Twitter at wannabe rounder. That's W A N N A B E R O U N D E R. And so, um, yeah, so that's what it's going to end up happening is, uh, Got the roundup coming up this week. We got a lot of big stories coming up. Uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for these perfect movies, guys, because these are the, if you're a film fan of any sort, I know, by the way, I know we've got a ton of great content out there right now. We've got Wakanda Forever. We've got, you know, Bones and All. We've got, you know, all these great movies. We're going to keep doing that stuff. We're, we're, you know, spoiler cast. When we go, we're going to go see the new Avatar next week. You know, we got the Fablemans coming out. We're we're gonna be we're gonna be doing all these spoiler casts and everything else. So stay tuned. It's gonna be a huge twenty twenty three. So he's Gabe. I'm Dave, and this has been Real Talks. Bye bye guys. <laughs>